Social Democratic Party candidate Adewole Adebayol alleges Peter Obi of the Labour Party, Atikwa Bubaka, PDP, and Bola Tinubu of the APC cheated through INEC. This is Plus Politics. My name is Nyamgu Agaji. Prince Adebayo Adewole, the presidential candidate of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, in the February 25 election, has alleged that the Labour Party, LP, People's Democratic Party, PDP, and All Progressives Congress, APC, received their piece of the Independent National Electoral Commission's cheating during the 25th of February poll. The presidential election may have come and gone, but mixed reactions continue to trail the victory of the president-elect, Bola Ahmed Tinubu. The SDP candidate also accused INEC of aiding cheating, which affects its credibility, and then called on the president-elect to reach out to aggrieved contestants. He also flayed INEC, calling it a crime syndicate, demanding dollars to make politicians winners. INEC, he alleged, has highly dishonest staff. Well, we're being joined now to review the presidential elections uh, by the presidential candidate himself of the SDP, Adewole Adebayo. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. It's, it's a really uh, contentious uh, uh, event that happened on the 25th of February, 2023. Everybody was looking forward to this day. Everybody was looking forward to this election because for the first time, a lot of people, a lot of candidates were speaking to the issues. You were one of them. Speaking to the issues rather than just campaigning with arrogance and saying nothing and uh, just hoping to clinch the ticket or the presidency without anything. But now, just like Chatham House has said, you also have come out to say that it was fraught with irregularities. What else did you see in that 25th of February polls that is worth commenting on? Well, you see, there will be a lot of commentary on it. And sometimes the window for commentary can close. Uh, at the, immediately after the election uh, results were announced, uh, I was being asked by the media to react. At that time, no one had filed a petition. So I'm a lawyer. So once the matter is in court, you can only talk about the developmental aspects where people can learn from, and you don't want to be, look like uh, you contested with people, and one person was declared, some of the contestants went to court, mm -hmm. and now you are on television prosecuting the same matter. Mm -hmm. So when I spoke with, um, I think, Arise TV, I'm sure that's where you got some of what you said, at that time, uh, no one had gone to court. But even today, people were in court over the matter. Mm -hmm. So it would be unseemly for a lawyer like me to be discussing the exact same issues that are before the court. However, I can make general honest commentary regarding the fact that um, we missed an opportunity to perfect our electoral process. Mm -hmm. and. We ought to be honest with ourselves uh, regarding what we need to do to eradicate once and for all the notion that we cannot conduct credible elections. And if we are going to do that, we need to learn from those who participated. And from what they learn, like me, from what I've learned, I think that it is not subjudice to say that Nigerians need to learn to participate in an election without cheating. That voters should develop the spirit of not expecting politicians to pay them before they come out to vote. That the political class should have some class when it comes to how to access power and they should not try to cheat in the process. 
three, that political parties themselves have to be extremely patriotic to the country. Uh, four, that those who have anything to do with election management, whether it's INEC chairman, whether it's the commissioners, whether it's the resident electoral commissioners, whether it's um, their staff, permanent staff, and ad hoc staff, starting from five chancellors to NYC, UCO members, that everybody, including the media, uh, that we should understand that it's a patriotic duty, and that it doesn't matter actually in the end uh, who becomes president or governor or senator, if we cannot collectively run a system that works. Mm. Uh, because if it's seen as um, to win at all costs, this is what I've observed, the, willing, the desperation to win at all costs, and where if you don't use sharp practices, you're regarded as not ready, or you are not wise, or you are foolish. And uh, every camp, all sides, are using the same methods to try to game the system. And I think that is not going to serve us well in the long run. But if you have elected a government, you have to live with that government. And the process which is going on in the court now is also a legitimate part of the electioneering, in that uh, if you participate in an election and you don't like the outcome of that election, if you go to court to challenge it, whether you have a good case or you don't have a good case, it's, leg it's a legitimate part of the process. Uh, what I was guarding against was a situation where people would not comply with the peace accord. It is called a peace accord for that reason that it should guarantee peace. But if you want justice, you can go to court to pursue justice. But the peace is what the peace accord guarantees. So anything you do which does not threaten the peace, you are in accord with the peace accord. Mm. And that is my understanding of the issues. So for as long as the matter is in the court, commentary will be careful to avoid the situation where anything you say will be seen as an attempt to influence the court or preempt the court or prejudge the case. But there's wide latitude for us to interrogate our attitude to electioneering over time in this country and how 2023 was a golden opportunity uh, with the use of technology, with the fact that there was no incumbent uh, contesting, with the fact that um, we registered uh, a sizable number of younger people, uh, with the fact that INEC had all the resources given to it, and with the fact that um, the number of candidates reduced from several dozens, which it used to be, to now just about 18, hopefully uh, maybe there will be a better way next time to also further shrink the number so that uh, it will be less cumbersome for for everybody concerned. But I think that um, nobody, anybody who says that we've done well uh, is not really being honest with the system. We haven't done well at all. And you don't have to rely on me to say that. You will see that almost everybody who is involved in it, uh, both the winner and the losers, uh, are complaining. Okay, um, we will try to skip what we can skip, but yeah. if it comes, we will be careful about it, exactly. as you have said. But uh, let's try to to see what we can address. Um, let's go a little bit more personal uh, than just talking wide. You promised to unite this country and eradicate poverty, and now you lost an election. How far with that dream? How do you intend to pursue that dream, or have you dropped it for good? No, not at all. You see, I I'm more concerned about poverty and insecurity. I believe that the basis for unity is already there. It's just that it's a unity uh, that is affected by a crisis. It's like a couple, they've agreed to get married, and they have now married. But if they are dealing with housing issue, dealing with how to feed the family, dealing with unemployment, you, you'll see that they'll have a lot of irritation 
there will be a lot of tension in the relationship. And that is what is happening in Nigeria. Nigerians are united to be together. Uh, for people like me, even people before who are older than me, we've not known any other country uh, than Nigeria. I don't think anybody is alive today. Very few people are alive today who were not born Nigerians. Because anyone born since 1915 has always known Nigeria. So, and uh, I used to listen to my great-grandmother telling me about time before Nigeria was created. You know, but I don't see anybody around now these days who knows that. And majority of the people we have now were born after independence. So you see that this is the only country we have, and everything, everyone you see now has always been around, every ethnicity, every religion. So we are in this together. But what I wanted to do was to remove areas where we have conflict. And that area will be the area of the artificial scarcity, which our means governance has created. So where we compete for things that we should have in abundance. So we compete for job placements. So as a result of that competition, we use religion, we use ethnicity to compete. We compete for school enrollment. So if you have um, a, one million students trying to go to the university and you have just about 300,000 um, spots, then you are likely to be doing area of um, zonal thing, you start to do uh, catchment area, you have to do all of that. Correct. If you have um, kids trying to go to federal government colleges, where you are supposed to have one per Per local, uh, per local government, or per, one per senatorial district, or per federal district, you have like one in three states. So then you will have to now start rationing it. Then you will say, okay, if you're from this state, you have more of your type of your people in that place. So these are, these are all the things that bring uh, tension. So I, 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 during the campaign, I made a lot of references to how it used to be when you graduate from school. Five jobs will be waiting for you. There was no room for you to remember that you have somebody from your family working there or from your town because you had five options. You had to choose one. But now, if you're trying to recruit a simple thing like policemen, you are trying to recruit 10,000. 200,000 will apply. Then you will now be forced to say, okay, we cannot take all the 10,000 from one place. Therefore, let's ration it. So these are the things that cause the, the, the rationing, as you're saying it, yes. a lot of people have blamed it, uh, blamed it on, on the population. And a lot of things that are going wrong, people have also blamed it, especially those people at the helm of affairs anyway, said that the, the population is causing things to be scarce, as you are saying. So do you think the five jobs that were waiting for the people in the 60s, for instance, could have still been the order of the day now that we have a population of over 200 million? It's not, a, it's not the population. It's the mismanagement of resources. We have more resources now than we had before. We have more skills now than we have before. What we don't have is we have a weaker leadership than we had before. We had a, we had a fairer leadership before. We had... Um, Many parts of Nigeria at that time were not developed. There were not much. When we got independence, how many industries did we have? But they were serious about it. They tried to create opportunity. What is happening now is that we'll be having government that, does, that have not been creating opportunities. And when you don't create opportunities, uh, especially well-structured opportunities, there will be artificial scarcity. And when you misapply resources, what it means is that uh, the, the, the portion of the population that has access to public resources will be shrinking further and further, and you leave the rest uh, to fend for themselves. So it's about making investment in structure. So there's a government now that is coming in, so this is where they need to pay attention. Uh, it, is, it doesn't matter who, who won the election. The problems will remain the same. You have to deal with security. You have to keep the country secure. In terms of territorial integrity, in terms of neighborhood safety, in terms of uh, law and order, you, you need, and in terms of other security that people need to have. Uh, employment is a form of security because it guarantees that you have an income. So if you are working, for example, in NNPC, you know that unless you misbehave, you are likely to spend your entire career there. So you are secure. Uh, if you work in Central Bank, 
if you work in the university as a, as a professor, as a lecturer, you know that once you get employment into these places, unless you misbehave, you, you, are, you are secure. And many of the other good companies, so we need to create more of that so that people have that sense of security and that way they would kind of uh, plan their life, they will behave better and they will be able to also assist others who are, who are, who are coming because the essence of, of governance is that you solve immediate problems, you solve historical problems, mm. you also lay a foundation to predict the future and solve the problems. That is why you, for the manpower that you need now, you train people. But why do we put uh, kindergarten? Why do we put them in school? Why do we put um, five-year-olds, six-year-olds in school? Because we are trying to put, produce the doctors of tomorrow, the journalists of tomorrow. So it, these are the roles of government. And the essence of my running for office is I've seen the resources that the country has. I've seen the opportunity the country has. I've seen that we have everything, and, but we, do, we do don't have a leadership that can direct. And now the election has been lost and won. It is the duty of the persons who are now uh, to direct the government to pick up those priorities, especially given that in this country it's much easier for you to find your way because we are one of the few countries, I think India is also one of them, that has this fundamental objective and directive principle of state policy. So that if, when you come into government, you don't have to scratch your head and start afresh and say, where do I start now? How are we going to govern? how the government should be, what priorities should be, the principle around which we you govern, all of them have been agreed and they are in the Constitution, Chapter 2. Okay. So all you need to do is to create the politics I look forward to is the politics in which that becomes the national consensus and that when people are making choices of who to become president, governor, they are making it in the security that any of these people that you elect will still go and implement. Now, what I was asking you, and I'm still asking you, is that um, you had all these lofty dreams for the country, yes. but the fact that you did not uh, clinch the ticket or you didn't go to the throne, as it were, to be the president and do all this means that those dreams are still somewhere. How are you going to share these dreams with the incoming uh, president or so, or how do you intend, how, for how long do you intend to wait? Are you coming back the next time to talk about this or to do what you intend to do now or it is over? No, it's not over. I, I, I made a promise when I became 50 years old last year that I will spend the rest of my life uh, serving the country. So I spent uh, 50 years growing up and taking care of myself, so I'm fine. So I will spend the rest of my life serving the country. But serving the country is not always that you must serve the government. Uh, what I'm doing now is public service. I, I believe so. And we have said enough, not only me, other people. We've said enough for those who want the election. If they want to do well, the first, of course, they have to implement their own program because they believe in their own program. But I believe that their own program will not be enough. So they have enough from what we have said, all the debates we've had, all the interviews, to go and pick up some ideas that may, they may find useful. But I believe that it is assumed that the Nigerian people also had everybody. It may not be the case, but I assume that the Nigerian people had everybody and they have made a preference that those people are the ones they want to listen to, that they want to implement their own. But what we have brought on board allows us to, com continue to continuously interrogate what they are doing and compare to what we will have been doing, and to continue to give Nigerian people uh, the differential. To say, you see, they've made 13% investment in education, uh, whereas they're supposed to make 27% investment in education. Mm -hmm. We had promised that we we're going to make even more than that. So you can see the difference in your choice now and what ought to be. And okay. in the areas where they are doing well, to say so, but I want people to understand that I will continue to be in politics. I will continue to pursue that dream. But two things are there. One, there is no compulsion that if you want to serve Nigeria, 
you must join every administration. There are some administrations you will not join. Mm. Either because you don't understand where they are going or because you can't work with the people who are there. Uh, then secondly, the fact that you are not in government does not stop you from reminding the people of options. And if the people who are in government uh, do something that is good, if people misunderstand them, you can actually recommend and say that measure is a That's good, good measure. People should cooperate with it. Okay. But um, the people in government don't own Nigeria. They have a four-year tenure to go and serve in specific offices. The country still belongs to all of us. Uh, so that is the money they are spending will be public money. The buildings that they use for their residences and offices, public property. The time that they spend is public time. So and all the resources that they are managing on our behalf belong to all of us. So there is no stake that the president-elect has okay. over me in Nigeria, <laughs> except that he's been given a legal authority to it's exercise that office. Okay. So you give him the difference, the difference when, when he immediately makes his decision, we're automatically entitled to say, it's a good decision, it's not a good decision, it's not good enough, and things like that. It's, it's our country. Okay, uh, let's go back to the election and some, some other specifics. Um, you said in your interview that I was privileged to see that um, you are the most aggrieved of the, yes. of the contestants. Yes. And you also said that you also sort of passed the blame to the electorate of the choice that they have made. Whether that is a, in contention or that is debatable is inconsequential. But let's start with the fact that you said you are the most aggrieved. In what ways uh, would you say that? You could see that a lot of people, some of the candidates started complaining only when they saw the results, and the results were not, wasn't going their way. Some started complaining when they got to the um, election point, the polling units, and they're getting feedback. I started complaining much earlier. If you go review my interview, I've been complaining that one, many of these candidates were not keeping to the law. They were not keeping to the spending limits. And if you look at them, you'll see that the politics was too expensive. They were spending um, obscene amounts of money. And I've, I've had journalists ask me, if you have to, won't you spend? So I assume that, that those journalists don't know me. Because if they know me, they won't ask that kind of question. They will know that if I want to spend, I have two. It's just that you must be lawful. Second, you will see that many of them were not allowing, especially those who are in government, they were not allowing other people to campaign quite well. Many of the governors were misbehaving. Those in government were misbehaving. You will also see that um, many of them were campaigning in the wrong places, in religious centers, which is against the law. Uh, things like that. So you also see that uh, they started, uh, even on election, they started enticing voters with material things. Some were giving money out. So this kind of behavior, I've been complaining for a long time. And I, so I feel aggrieved that we went into a race and people were not keeping to the terms of the race. Because if you follow what INEC specifies in the book, you will see that it will be a more even race. Uh, I complain about the media coverage as to the fact that media over commercialize the issue. And it, it, it cannot be the case that if you spend more money, you should have more access to the people. That is not how it's done. For adverts, yes. If somebody wants to place 100 jingles, no problem. That should be commercialized. But if you want to give access to people to present their message, to answer questions, uh, to do debates, you should give equal access uh, to everyone. So I've, these are all the accumulated grievances that I've had. And in this, so it is only when the final blow was now delivered in the, in the conduct of the election that you will start to complain. Uh, I, that's, I've been complaining over time, and many of those complaints have not been addressed. And when you put them all together, you will see that it, I find it difficult to align with anyone with respect to um, you, cherry picking what you want to complain about. Whereas I can cite and say 
you yourself were not in compliance with many critical aspects of the election hearing. Even on the election day, you were not in compliance with many things. And why I need to refrain from over litigating the issue is that people have gone to court. And if, if you pay keen attention, especially when you see the pleadings, when you pay keen attention, you will see that these things that I'm talking about in general terms, the evidence of it will come in the trial. So Nigerians, those who might be uh, irritated by how I'm approaching the issue, when they see the petition, the cross petition, the evidence and the counter evidence, and they see, they will see that it's a mess all around. And they will, they Is will it one of the reasons that made you not to go to court? Because some people, uh, including myself, I'm expecting that uh, if you are aggrieved, you will address it in a legal way, except you just want to give up for peace to reign. Because you did say that in some polling units, even your own votes that glaringly were given to you yes. were not recorded. Yes. They gave you maybe 19, where yes. you should have had 90-something and yes. all that. So are you just giving up because you want peace to reign, or you don't think that should even be an option at all? You see, okay, people need to understand that, first, I'm a lawyer. So because I'm a lawyer, if something like that happened to somebody else, typically I'm the one that will come for advice, mm. who will say, well, I know what happened to you, but this is how the court looks at it. So that's one. Second is that, and you will see over time, when you see how the, when the court starts to rule on it, you will understand the wisdom of what I'm saying now. Second, you will also know that I've not given up. Given up means that I just buy a ticket and fly to New York. And you ask me what happened, I say I don't want to talk about it. That's giving up. Raising it in the consciousness of people, talking about it, emphasizing it, and addressing it from the systemic way it is. When you are going to court, you are having a specific prayer from the court. Mm. And the prayers you can pray to the court are limited. You can ask the court to cancel the election. You can ask the court to declare you the winner. Now, I've tabulated that if, if, if all my legitimate votes were given to me, I don't have enough to tell the court to declare me the winner. So, because that's the first thing I did. But they could declare some of the people no, no, of this your, is how the court your party. Works. No, this is how the court works. My party, for example, we want two Senate seats. So it's likely that somebody will go and challenge us on those fraternity, but nobody has complained so far. We won five, yeah. in, in one state, we won five out of the six House of Reps. We still have governorships that I believe we will win uh, quite a number of them. So the notion that I can go to court and say the court should declare me a winner uh, in places where I didn't win. I can complain that where I won, my votes were not duly recorded. Yeah. But I cannot make a claim that if you restore all my votes, because the court will say, okay, I've had you. If I restore all the vote they took from you, you after three months, six months of trial, you still didn't win the election. So, you, so they, that angle of saying the claim is the winner is out. But there may be other people, other contestants, who, when they put their own votes together, they will say, ah, the court can declare them the winner. Then I'm not going to comment on their own opportunities. They can do and do that. So maybe where you took uh, 2,000 votes from me, you took 20,000 from them or 200,000, they have a better chance of going to complain, of, of going to get it realized. Second thing is that when I put all together, uh, the cheating, the cheating is done by one person. So and in law, you... I can say the election is marked by irregularities. Mm. But the law is that if it's marked by irregularity, irregularity must be such that if you remove all the irregularities, the person who won will still not win. No, no, no. So well, I'm, I'm, I'm not letting you... I'm yeah, just, I'm, I'm trying to... I'm looking understand. at it from the... No, I want to explain to you because you are looking at it from a legal point of view. Mm. And I'm saying that if you have a wrong done to you in a society... There are some of the wrongs you can go and write in the court. And there are some of the wrongs you can write by advocacy. 
And for me, I have looked at my own case. I'm not going to comment on another person's case. And they haven't sought my opinion on their matter. Two things I decided to do. One is that anything that will be a breach of the peace, demonstration, whatever, whatever, I'm out of it. Why? Not because I don't have a right to protest, but because I'm running for I was running for president. And I went to a gentleman's agreement that if I was cheated or anything went wrong, I was not going to breach the peace. I was going to take legal, legal costs. So that issue of me leading the demonstration is out of it for me. Mm. Uh, second, if I am going to pursue things that are wrong in the election, I have people who I have grievances against that are not even candidates at all. I'll give an example that inside our party, we are doing reviews. So I've seen cases in our party where certain officials of our party took our party uh, agent's tag and went and gave it to the opposite party. The court cannot help you in that situation. It, maybe the party can discipline them, expel them from the party, or sanction them. So, for example, I'm sure you have reporters, and they do, for that, they do reporting for you, or maybe they've reported to you already, you will see cases where people were selling their votes. Those people selling their votes, I cannot take them to court. I'm not the police. And I cannot sue them in the election petition and say, this person sold his vote, therefore, no. So what I can do is to say, OK, I've been exposed to how we conducted this election. And if I am invited, as I'm invited by you, to come and explain, I owe a duty to you to explain in detail what happened. And also to make recommendations of what we need to do. If, for example, INEC invites me, then I can assist INEC with detail of how they need to reform their system. Okay. You remember that in 2007, when Yaradua was elected, there was a hue and cry, even louder than this, regarding that election. And what, and some people went to court, General Buhari went to court, I think uh, Elijah Abubakar Atiku went to court as well. But what Yaradua did was to come by way of advocacy. Notwithstanding that the case, cases were in court, he said this election was marred by, mm. it, was, it was not a perfect one. I don't, I don't want to misquote him. And that he would do something about it. And he set up the Waste Panel. So many of the things that went wrong at that time were the things the Waste Panel looked into. And they were the things we included in our Electoral Act. Now, I suspect that the president-elect now, if he's well advised, and if he wants to lead with credibility and honesty, okay. would have to toe that line and say, I think something is wrong with this election. But if he, for example, pretends to himself that nothing is wrong with the election, and his election is perfect, is the best we have done so far, then he will have failed in leadership. Okay, let's, uh, me, let's, just, let's just take a short break okay. because uh, there's a lot to talk about in right. this very issue, for clarity anyway. Not, yes. uh, yeah. We'll just take a short break and we'll be back in a moment. Don't go away. You're welcome back. It's still, uh, the, uh, it's still Plus Politics, and my name is Nyamgul Agaji. We're here with the uh, presidential candidate of the Social Democratic Party, uh, Adewole Adebayo, who uh, he lost, yes, but he is uh, going through other ways to make sure that uh, the process is better tomorrow, right? Okay, before we went on break, I asked you about what you're going to do if you're still having that dream and how you intend to pursue it. And you said something about the fact that even if all your votes are added, you will still not win the elections. So there's no point. Now, I was asking for clarity because sometimes they say posterity should know the, the exact thing that happened. For instance, if someone accuses you falsely and you go to court and they say that you are supposed to pay a fine of, uh, go to prison or pay a fine of 10 naira, 
and somebody says, I'm going to contest that and see it to the end, the reason they will give you is that if I pay it, I'm still an ex-convict, no matter that the 10 naira is small. So the exact thing should be known, no matter how small it is. Now, how would posterity see the election that, you conduct, that was conducted, that you were a part of, if the votes that were supposed to come to you, whether they are just 1,000 or they are 100,000, if they are not recorded against your name, don't you see that as an injustice done to you? Because we need to know in 2023, uh, when, when he contested in an election, this is how much he had. If you're going down in the next election, let's know by how many votes. If you're going up, let's know by how many votes. So don't you think it is a problem to just leave it go? No, you're not leaving it. If I was leaving it, I won't talk about it. All I'm letting you know is that I'm a lawyer. I know legal process. So when you are going to court in an election matter, and I'm trying to run away from talking about election matter so that uh, people will not assume that I'm signaling mm. other people's cases. What I'm letting you know is that I know that what went wrong went beyond what a court can look into. Because there are, there are grounds. Mm. If you're filing a little bit, it's a very technical, lawyer call it sui generis. It's a very technical um, process, very technical procedure. So even if you go to court, you will see that when, if people have read previous judgments, for example, let me give an example. That's how I was talking about Yaradua. If you read the Waste Panel report, and you compare it Which with, was not implemented, though. Partly, it was the duty of um, Good Lord Jonathan to implement them. It was his duty, but he probably didn't want to implement them fully. But a lot of the recommendations are included in the Electoral Act that we have now. But what I want you to understand is that if you look at that Waste report, on the election and compare it with the judgments in Buhari versus Yaradua and Atiku versus Yaradua, it doesn't look like they are the same elections. Because in a litigation mode, people deny everything. The people object to every evidence. But in advocacy, people don't. Mm. So when you come before a waste panel, when you come before, you actually um, bring it out, because now there's no sanction. Mm. So you are bringing out uh, what happened. So if, for example, you, are, you, are, you want to do a research on vote buying, if you are doing inside court, everybody will say, I never bought vote. It's not me. It's not me at all, because they are trying to run away from sanction. But when you bring it out in terms of trying to correct the process, people will be more open. So that's what you intend to do. Yeah, exactly. Because like INEC, after I address INEC, you will see that INEC came out and said that the election they did had a lot of faults. But I can guarantee you that when INEC goes to court now, INEC lawyer will not say that. INEC lawyer will say, go and prove this and that. Because the nature of litigation, I worked uh, uh, as Truth and Reconstitution Commissioner in Liberia after the war. I have seen how, let me give you an example. Look at how South Africa did the truth and reconciliation. Mm. Look at our Puta panel. In South Africa, the truth and reconciliation commission was done in such a way that there was no sanction involved. But they wanted to get to the truth of it. So many people in South Africa who had killed people that were not even charged to court, people didn't discover. They came out for long trailing and said, you know, there was a particular person that died so soon so I killed the person and I want to come and make atonement. They were volunteering to come out. Everybody who did something came out because the atmosphere was they wanted to know the truth of what happened. But when we did our Puta panel, people were coming with lawyers, deny obvious evidence because with the spirit of trying to know what happened rather than trying to blame somebody. So that is, I, I feel it that those who are complaining now, those who are making noise now, they will go to court. Cases will be won and lost. But I want to find out, why is it that in this country, with everything we have gone through, there are still people who will not vote unless you pay them to vote? I went to Kwara State 
after uh, after the election, after my election, I went to Kwara State to campaign for my governorship candidate. But I met with my party people. And I was asking that question. Why do you belong to a political party? And you want to represent that party? And you don't want to be loyal to that party? What is the reason? Why do you join it at all? You, you get the point I'm making? So there are these conversations we need to make. I've, I was talking to some of my fellow presidential candidates today. I asked some of them, are you going to court? Some said they're not going to court. Some said they're quitting politics. Some said they will wait. But this conversation will go on. So you won't hear the last of it. If, if somebody goes to court, because of the nature of their pleadings, because of what they're asking for, if the court throws away their case, for me, it's still not the end of the discussion. Because we'll write books on it, we'll document it, we will do seminar on it, we'll find out what went wrong. And historians, analysts, everybody will come out. If you go back to 1979 election, it ended up in the Supreme Court or the definition of 12 to 3rd. It's on a very narrow technical. But what happened in the entire election was not discussed. So I'm <coughs> looking at it. If I wasn't a lawyer, I would probably run to a lawyer, and that lawyer might tell me, yeah, you have a good case, let's go. Okay. But because I'm a lawyer, I understand the legal uh, conundrum that is there. I thought to myself, one of the things I can contribute is to, if I'm asked, mm -hmm. to actually tell you what I experienced and tell you all those things that are wrong with our electioneering and to give us a clarion call that every election we will encounter it. Because I saw it in Ekiti, I saw it in Oshun, and I was raising alarm in Ekiti. If you go back to yeah. my previous statement in Ekiti, you will see that this is Ekiti, writ large. We will, we will try to follow, follow you as you do your advocacy and yes. see what you're doing and see what we can contribute as yes. well because we want a process in this country that will be transparent enough because that is everything, if it is transparent and is good enough. Uh, but we just got information that um, uh, the prayers of Labour Party, for instance, that the bimodal voter race, be the beavers, should not be tampered with, should not be reconfigured for until all the evidences therein are removed, has been thrown away. And INEC has been given leave to go and reconfigure this. Don't you see this as obstruction of... Uh, uh, no, evidence. you see, I see... Let's that, be as brief as possible. You know, I have there is a persons. lot of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. You know, there's too much speculation. Yeah. And uh, media too, I don't know why I keep saying media, but media too doesn't have technical people to explain things to them. The controversy was meaningless. Whether you reconfigure it, it will not remove the data that was there before. So I, I don't know, political parties were trained on how the beavers should work. They were introduced to it. And, but I don't want to insert myself into it. It's not an issue. It's not a problem. In the sense that configuring the beavers for the next election, does, it's just like you go on a computer, you type a letter. Uh, or, uh, you type a letter and post the letter. And then you want to type another and open another page. You, you, you get my point. So unless INEC deliberately wants to throw away the evidence, Mm. But in reality, it, you can so it's do fine. one election, do another one without... I think when the court made that order, mm. the court made the order on the assumption that reconfiguring it will, not will wipe everything. out the data. But I don't think so. Unless okay. they want to deliberately do so. Okay. Um, before the presidential election, there was this talk that uh, uh, SDP is an appendage of uh, APC. And then people started saying, which you roundly refuted anyway, that you had given up your seat for the APC. You had, you had given up your aspirations for the APC candidate. You denied that. You said it wasn't true. And even the Labour Party also, I think, came up with that. But now, after saying that and making everybody believe that, okay, you are not an appendage of any other party. We just got information also that the deputy governorship candidate in Lagos State said he has, she has assessed all the candidates of, uh, that are standing for election and she has chosen to follow the candidate of, P, of the APC. 
She is a deputy candidate, deputy governorship candidate, and now she is cross carpeting and endorsing another one. What's your reaction to that act? My reaction is to first find out that it is true because I've been a victim of all this unfounded information mm -hmm. personally. So you could see that uh, um, the, I was going to quite well on my own. The first people to start sending insinuation were the APC. You know, maybe they were threatened by what we were doing, so they started passing rumors about discouraging people. So then PDP also picked it up. They started doing it and reacted to that. Then, most disappointingly of all, Labour. They all waited and timed their own on the eve of the election. And I said that we have stepped down for them. So I think this is, these are some of the grievances that I have. And these are the, some of the grievances that you find in Nigerian politics. If you study the politics of other countries, if you are in your party, they just leave you alone. For example, when we were running for president, there were people from the Labour Party in Kano, in the Northeast, who said they wanted to come and declare. For, I'm not interested. If you, want, if you want to leave your party and come and join a party, go to your world and join a party. I don't, have, I don't believe in a system of trying to damage other people's brand. Well, I didn't. After some time, they went and did it with the APC. That's their business. I'm not interested. So I believe that we should try to do ideological politics here, politics of principle. But as for the person that you refer to, as long as we as a political party, we have not been told. The person hasn't resigned from our party. Has it Remember what happened to NNPP in Kano, where Sheikh Arau was said to have left, left the party and crossed to... You could see that eventually INEC announced Sheikh Arau as a winner of a senatorial seat under NNPP. So party, these rules are there. So, I don't, so I, I, I don't want to get into speculation because it may turn out that, for example, unless you call her into your studio or some studio and she's interviewed and she says it's true. Otherwise, I, people were... When I, on the Friday, Friday, on the eve of the election, I was at an airport in Abuja going to Ondo to, to go and vote. I saw people who were obedient hugging me. Oh, thank you for stepping down for us. I said, Please, what are you give me? I will step down for you. So, so okay. if you have fallen, if you have, if you have, okay, let's try to. If, if, so, if you have fallen victim of yeah. that, yeah. you want to be sure that you hear from your husband's mouth. Okay, let's yes. let's let's try to wrap it up now. We, we yeah. have like a minute. Uh, yes. What's the future of SDP? Are you considering measures? Are you standing alone? Are you? The what? future of SDP is not as important as the future of Nigeria. As long as Nigeria has this kind of problem that it has now, they will always need an SDP. You always need a party that wants to deal with the issue of poverty and insecurity. But let's say the government that has just been elected now deals with insecurity decisively. Then it's no longer an issue. That's why you don't find us saying we want to get independence for Nigeria. Because before we came, yes, some party had done it. That's why you don't see us. When we first came, it was how to get rid of military rule. Now we don't have military rule anymore. So if the government that you elect solves this problem that we are concerned about, there may be a time where you won't have SDP. If, for example, poverty is eradicated completely, insecurity is gone, you may see that the other party will change what it wants to do. But it's not about the future of the party. It's more about the future of the country. And I pray and hope that the government that has just been okay. uh, elected now will solve these problems that SDP is supposed to solve. But if they don't solve it, and they've been rigged my roof for another four years, we'll be back to yeah. try to solve that problem. Okay, keep us in the know uh, as you go about uh, using the um, public forum, as you call it, to expose the things that uh, you have seen, uh, things that will be lessons to be learned by INEC, by the citizens, by the politicians themselves and all that. So, But for now, we'd like to thank you for being a part of our program today. And we're hoping that this contact will continue. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate so it. And I wish Nigeria well. God bless Nigeria. Yeah. So we've been talking with uh, the 
uh, presidential candidate for SDP. I remember SDP was the first party I voted for anyway. Oh, yes. <laughs> in 1993. Yes. I won't okay. ask you why you voted last week. <laughs> no, no, no. Yes. Uh, that's a different story all, yeah. uh, entirely. But we've been talking with the presidential candidate at Dewali, at Debayo, of the SDP, and we've been talking about how the election was and the way forward for Nigeria. We do hope that we'll get to that point where every politician's the interest they will be thinking about is the interest of Nigeria. So when they say there are different interests, it should be different interests that could lead to the goal of Nigeria becoming something of an Eldorado that we've always thought about. Thank you so much for being a part of this show. It's a so, pleasure. Thank you. Let's do it again tomorrow. My name is Nyamgul Agaji.